Impact Hustlers, the podcast on entrepreneurs and change makers that are creating solutions to the world's biggest problems. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact. And this is your host, Michael Shafrat. In today's episode, I talk to Amy Williams, founder and CEO of Good Loop, a startup on a mission to use advertising for good. Good Loop rewards visitors of websites for watching video ads by donating 50% of revenues to charity. In that way, people can donate to charity without even having to spend a penny of their own money. The ads don't only have a positive impact, but also improve the results of advertisers with significantly higher engagement on the ads presented. Amy has been selected as one of the Forbes 30 under 30 in 2018, and Good Loop now works with major brands such as Unilever, Coca-Cola, and Canon. Amy, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Um, many people are viewing ads as annoying or a necessary evil that some website hosts need to need to have to make money. Um, how does your approach uh, make ads work for both advertisers and those that visit those websites? So we offer a value exchange. If you are on a website, say you're on, I don't know, the independent, and you're looking at a piece of content, we will display an ad there, which if you choose to engage, you don't have to, you can skip it. But if you choose not to skip and you choose to give the advertiser some of your precious time and attention, you can give 50% of the advertiser's money to a charitable cause of your choice. So really it's about offering a, a, a value exchange for your time so that the user feels rewarded and they feel like they've you know got something out of it and the advertiser gets better engagement. So it's a kind of win-win. Um, there's been a number of startups uh, trying to reward users for watching ads. I think I've seen a bunch that kind of mm -hmm. pay you some coins or even some cash to, to do stuff. Um, and it seems like nothing of that has had massive success, at least not to my knowledge. What are you doing different? Is it that people just like donating so much? Or what is it that drives people to actually then watch your ads? Yeah, I mean, the ad formats where you watch an ad to unlock levels or points, that is still offering a value exchange. So it is a more rewarding and perhaps more respectful experience. So this it's definitely like got a place and a role. And I think it's a really interesting format. Where we're sort of differentiating is in terms of the reward being actually relevant to the advertising that you're watching. So when you watch, for ex to give an, a tangible example, actually, we ran a campaign with Unilever's Noor product, which is like their stock cubes and soups. And when you watch the Noor advert, you can then choose a soup kitchen or food bank to donate to. So the charities that you're supporting are relevant to the brand. They're reinforcing the values of the brand and creating a little bit of a halo effect so that you have a more positive advertising experience. So I guess it's it's kind of like the rewarded ads, but it's just... A more positive and more relevant reward. Mm. And and the brands, I guess, um, on the one hand, get to make an impact and associate with the this positive impact, but also get better results. Can you talk about that? Yeah, a bit? yeah, yeah. Exactly that. No, it's exactly that. And, th and that, to me, is the most important thing about the business. If we were building a platform that just gave money to charity and you know, made us all feel warm and fuzzy inside, it wouldn't scale because you have to be able to prove those results and you have to deliver advertising that's ultimately as effective, if not more effective versus competitors. Um, so we really focus on things like engagement rates, looking at the percentage of people that are watching the ads, looking also at things like brand uplift. So do people have a more positive perception of your brand after they go through this experience? And do they remember the ads more, looking at recall um, in comparison to, to non-ethical advertising? So it's really those metrics that we use to quantify the value that we're offering above and beyond the warm, fuzzy feeling. Mm -hmm. Is there any case study you can share with one of the brands that you worked with that you know maybe they came in and they were surprised by what you were able to deliver for them any any yeah. success stories there oh loads of success <laughs> <A lot>. stories <laughs> um yeah we did a really really lovely campaign with uh with Kit Kat actually so this was um in support of something called the, the Nestle Cocoa Plan so it's a an NGO sponsored by Nestle which works with um various different um sustainable cocoa farming initiatives in Sierra Leone so it's a really positive and uh, important part of the Nestle Cocoa uh, supply chain, but it's quite dry as a topic. Like it's all very, 
you know, it's like a big, thick PDF that the shareholders read. It's, a re- it's really hard to communicate that stuff in an engaging way. So what we did was we took the KitKat advert, which they were running over Christmas. We ran it through our ethical player. And then the three charities we, we featured were three projects within the Nestle Cocoa plan. So you could support female farming um, veg kits. You could give to uh, putting solar charges in community centers, or you could fund school kits. And so all the money went to the Cocoa plan, but the user chose which project they wanted to support or which initiative they wanted to support and that worked really well we ended up getting um, a 65% decrease in negative brand sentiment and a 13% increase in positive brand sentiment which was an amazing result because it was Mm. just showing that actually we're really shifting perceptions and we gave some we funded something like over 300 school kits in Mm. Sierra Leone which was awesome wow Wow. Uh, that's great Uh, are you actually like a whole separate ad network so if I run a website do I have to sign up and kind of have you or do you tap into existing ad networks how does it work if if people want to integrate your ads we typically tap into existing networks so we have a programmatic um we we basically have a plug into a programmatic exchange which means we can buy on websites all over the internet globally all right and and that's through existing networks out there so yeah, can, exactly. We, I did start when I started the business. Mm. I was looking more at working directly with publishers mm. because I do think there's a lot of value in publishers improving the user experience on mm. their sites, and um, you know, lots of publishers do have really interesting charitable uh, partnerships and um, initiatives. The problem I was finding when I was starting the business was that if I had to get publishers and brands on board, you suddenly create quite a two-sided marketplace and it's really hard to scale that kind of business. So that's why we decided to focus on just buying through the existing networks, which meant that we could really focus on growing just the advertiser side of the company. Mm. So it's meant that we could grow a lot faster and more efficiently. So if an advertiser goes to you and says, I want to be on that website, you're most likely going to be able to to put them there and uh, have your campaign there. Exactly. Great. Um I want to talk a bit about your story as a founder uh, of the company. And as far as I see from from my little research I've done is uh, you you started out as a solo founder, right? Uh, you you ha- had the idea. You were just by yourself. Uh, you didn't have the tech background necessary. Um, so how did you go about starting this? Like, did you find somebody to join you? Like, how 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 did this all work in the very yeah. beginning? Okay, so I was working in an advertising agency. Um, was learning a lot about the ad industry, was building my network of, you know, future potential customers. So I had a lot of the commercials, but without anyone to build the product, without anyone on the technical side, it's very hard to get that initial investment. It's very hard to get people to back you when essentially you're just a randomer with a PowerPoint slide, <laughs> like which is really all I was when I started out. I had an idea, a lot of PowerPoint slides and a lot of enthusiasm, and that was it. So I really needed to find a co-founder. I needed to find someone that could build it and could understand it as well and know what we needed. So I I, I really struggled. It's really hard to find um, developers who also understand the vision that you, you know, buy into your vision and, and want to commit to it. And, um, and, and I was really, really fortunate. I wrote a job ad on a website called workinstartups.com and it's this super pirate website it looks rubbish I never thought anything would come of it (laughs) but I was desperate so I wrote this job ad and um, alongside a lot of weirdos one person that replied was uh, a guy called Daniel Daniel was uh, he's a software developer living in Edinburgh been building ad tech and other white label software for over 10 years so he's a really experienced entrepreneur and he was really excited about the idea of using his skills for good so there was this immediate we we immediately clicked in terms of what we wanted to achieve and he brought a really interesting angle to it because he has a PhD in AI and has been working in artificial intelligence for years so he kind of took my idea which is a very commercial idea and then actually brought to it some interesting elements in terms of how the tech could really complement it Um, so we started the company together um, only a few months after meeting, which is quite oh. daunting. But um, yeah, we got some investment. So we started the business and we kind of started growing it quite quickly. Great. Um, besides maybe finding that co-founder, which is often a challenge for a lot mm. of uh, listeners as well that are kind of having the ideas, want to start a company. What's been the biggest challenge for you that you had to overcome uh, since you started out? Is there any kind of big learning or challenge that you overcame? Um, okay, so there's the biggest challenge that comes to mind is getting your first customer. 
that is the hardest thing I've had to do because everybody says they want to be innovative. Everybody says they want to do something new, but they also want to know the results. They want to know how did it go and what exactly am I going to get and how exactly is it going to work, which it, it, it doesn't, it defies logic how you can be the first and also want results, but that's just the way the world works. So I'd go to a lot of advertisers who were really excited about what we were doing, but just weren't ready to take that leap of faith. Um, and it took a long time to find uh, a business that was just willing to support, ultimately willing to support a, a, and take the risk. Um, and the company ended up selling our first campaign to is a company called Curb. Curb, they do street food markets all around London. Really awesome brand, like all about supporting small businesses around the UK. And they ran, um, I think it was like 150 quid worth of ads. Like it was a really small little deal, but it was a, a be, uh, like a brilliant well-known brand it was a campaign that got us some case studies got us some results got us some proof and then we could start going talking to the bigger customers and then quite quickly after that we signed Unilever who are obviously a global advertiser so getting that first customer finding that person that's going to champion you even when the risks are high that's really really tough and hmm. once you get that it all starts to flow. You build your case study around that you were able to show how successful everything was and then you just reached out to some of the contacts you had before or just... Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, perfect. yeah. You should reach out to the same people that said no before. And now I say, it's still innovative, but I also have a case study. And then they're ready to jump on board. Great. Um, one question, and that's like always the sweet spot of the entrepreneurs I'm trying to invite is that uh, I, I try to showcase companies that the more money they make, the more good they do mm. and vice versa. Um and obviously that's how you're set up as a as a business right mm. so the more advertising you earn the more money you make the more good you do through through the um yeah the 50 percent share um do you face a lot of people still that see this as a nice charity uh, uh that meet you for the first time and are like oh that's cute <laughs> um and how quickly can you convince them of, uh, well, this is a, this is a business mm. with a great impact? Do you still get that a lot? No. Yeah, good question. It's definitely something I got more at the beginning. Mm. Now I think we are starting to prove those people wrong. And part of that just comes from us having confidence in our in the fact we make a profit. I think at the beginning, I was a little bit apologetic about that, almost so, you know, well, we've got to keep the lights on. You know, it was justifying why we make money. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, we're going to make a lot of money. I'm, I'm, I'm in this to build a big business, a global business that's going to get investors and we're going to make our investors a lot of money too. And that, um, that growth is going to be fueled by the fact we do good. The fact we do good is our USP. It's the reason we're differentiated in the market. It's the reason our customers buy us. So it's not a nice to have. It's not you know, because we're good people. It's because it's how our business model actually functions. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love, I love that Goodloop has those two elements really, really closely intertwined. Definitely for when I'm selling to customers, I've learned to focus more on the results. Um, so you kind of, when I'm going into an advertiser, I always focus on we'll get 50 to 75 percent higher engagement. We'll get 65 percent decrease in negative sentiment. You know, those real hard stats. And then you go cherry on top. You're also giving to charity. Mm. It always has to go that way around um, because otherwise they will pigeonhole you. It's really interesting. Uh, I think a lot of entrepreneurs I meet uh, for this podcast, they say, you know, you really need to build the best product. You need to mm. really build the best experience for your customers. And then the impact is even greater. But, you know, like nobody will buy your product if it's inferior to everything else out there just because it has a positive impact is that yeah. what you see as well totally yeah it's almost like your your why as a founder the reason you've built the business is not the reason they're going to buy it and differentiating those two things is really important because mm. yeah your motivation might be very ethical and very you know, wholesome but yeah if it's not competitive it's not gonna it's not gonna survive mm -hmm. um if we look at the online advertising industry, I guess there's still a lot of challenges to be overcome. Like people usually still block ads. Uh, um, people don't like ads. What is it that you think are like the biggest challenges for online advertising? And maybe how do you think you could solve some of that in the future? Um, or what are the things that the industry needs to, needs to change? I think that one of the problems online advertising has facing is that 
it's become increasingly commoditized. It's become a race to the bottom where everybody's trying to get maximum reach for minimum cost. It's all become very, very cheap. And that's really driven, you know, this clickbaity headlines and fake news and everyone's just trying to get more and more clicks and more and more likes and more and more reach. And I think what's lacking is an appreciation of the human behind the click, you know, the actual user experience, the actual person on the internet that is suffering through your annoying adverts. That comes down to the metrics that advertisers are considering success by. You know, if you, I think this is something that is evolving, but if you're an advertiser and you think success is, we reached 50,000 people today, then you're going to just get them for as cheap as, and as efficiently as possible. If you're an advertiser who's thinking, well, we might only reach 10,000 people today, but all of them watched our ad all the way through and actually were coming out of that in a positive way. You know, they didn't find it annoying. They didn't desperately roll their, rolls and, uh, roll their eyes and try and skip it. Mm. Then... You might have paid a little bit extra, but you definitely got a better user experience and a better um, relationship with your consumer at the other end. So I think the key thing that needs to shift is the way that advertisers are measuring success. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from the user experience, so if, if I see an ad on a website, um, what happens with the donation from that ad? You, you said a case study before with the soup kitchens. Is it very individual depending on the brand or... Is there like a general kind of selection process for you? What kind of causes mm. the money goes to? How does it work? So the user experience is that you would be, say, say you're on the independent, you'd be watching a video and our ad would appear before it and there'd be a, a skip button. But if you don't skip, if you continue watching for at least 15 seconds and you'll see a countdown timer for 15 seconds. And then once you get past that point, you essentially unlock your donation and you'll see three buttons with three different charities or three different initiatives. And you can choose which of those three to give the money to. So for the user, it's a choice between three. The advertiser, the one who's actually paying for that donation, will choose that short list of three. So we'll always work with the advertiser to find charities that reinforce their values and that are relevant to their audience. Um, we did a campaign with Lynx, which is the you know, the body spray for yeah. uh, like young like young guys, and uh, they supported charities around male mental health depression and suicide which is such an important issue and so relevant to their audience um and then we, we did a campaign with benefit cosmetics supporting women's refuge shelters mm. so it, it's always linked to the brand which goes back to what i was saying at the beginning you know making sure that when you're rewarding the user for their time you're rewarding them in a way that is relevant to the advertiser mm. but people always have a choice between a few, yes. few options yes Great. exactly. so they can relate to to what they give the money to actually yeah, it's kind of mm. like the brand chooses the shortlist and gives the money, but the user has the ultimate say. So it's a, a bit of collaboration between the brand and the user. All right. Um, that that sounds great. I, th I think I would love to see that much more across across yeah. the web. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you think about the next 10 years with, with your company, what's the kind of world you're trying to create? Uh, what is the big goal that like you'd like to contribute to the world with what, what you're doing? Okay, the big, hairy, audacious goal <laughs> is I want to build a platform that connects brands, people and causes globally. I think that advertisers around the world are starting to think about purpose a lot more in their marketing. You know, big, big brands are now considering what they what what good they want to do, what impact they want to have, what they stand for for their consumers. So purpose is becoming something that's increasingly a big part of building a brand and building a relationship with your consumers. So I want Goodloop to be the owners of that space. I want us to be the experts in finding brands that want to talk about purpose and connecting them with people in a way that actually engages people, is meaningful and and results in tangible donations, results in real impact, rather than just a lot of hot air and greenwashing. You know, mm -hmm. I really want to use advertising to fund social change. Um, so yeah, the big vision is build a platform that does that at scale globally. You're running ads on Instagram, running ads on websites, running ads on Snapchat or Twitter or wherever it is we want to expand to. You know, we want to sit across the internet as this almost ethical layer that makes advertising fund a better world. Great. Um, uh, for anybody that's listening now that might work for a brand, if they want to work with you, I, I guess they should reach out via your website. It, it, what's the catch? Do they have to pay a bit more <laughs> than 
than uh, if they advertise somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, do you give away just some of your margin? How do you actually finance the donations? I love that. What's the catch question? I always get it. It's almost like, whose lunch are you eating? Like, how can you give this donation? Um, okay, so the way that the business model works is we charge the advertiser on a success model, which means if you... Going back to the example of you being on the independent and you see the skip button, if you skip, we don't charge the advertiser anything. We have to pay the independent for that space, but we don't make any money. So we would make a loss. But if you don't skip and you watch for at least 15 seconds, we then charge the advertiser for that engaged view. So they'll pay a little bit more, about 10% more than they would normally, but it's because they're only paying on a you know, genuine, successful video engagement. So brands like it because it means that they're using their money more efficiently. Um, and our business model is essentially, because of the ethical incentive, we get more people to skip. Um, we get more people to not, not skip. skip yeah. Yeah, yeah, we get more people to watch. Therefore, we get paid more often. Hmm. Therefore, we can make more money on the same space. So it's really a business model of, Buying inventory in bulk from the independent, increasing the value through the ethical incentive, and then using the increase in value to make the donation. So there's no catch Great. in answer. That sounds very good. Uh, so to anybody listening, please do reach out. Uh, oh, yeah. It's uh, great to hear your uh, vision. Uh, I'd love to see your ads much more and kind of enjoy much more watching them. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, can't wait to see you all over the web. So thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This was Impact Hustlers. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact. 